Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15475 in the name of Neil Finlay on Scottish Government declines help of MESH expert. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak, and speak buttons now, please? And I call on Neil Finlay to open the debate. Mr Finlay, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I can I thank all members who signed my motion and allowed it uh, to be debated today and my staff for their assistance uh, in uh, the event today. For the last seven years, I've been campaigning alongside women who have been uh, victims of debilitating mesh uh, the debilitating impact of mesh implants. Women who have seen their careers end, their relationships break down, who have lost their ability to walk, forced to use wheelchairs, women who have lost organs, and who live in cro constant chronic pain, affecting every aspect of their life. Some of these remarkable women are with us in the gallery tonight, and I salute their determination to be here uh, today. All through this campaign, they have acted in the interests of others. They have tried to get mesh banned so no other women would suffer like they have. They have. But there was no real hope of any change or improvement for them. But there is now. And they are rightly calling for action. Uh, many of these women have asked their GP or their consultant for help. And when they do, they can be referred to a consultant a uh, urogynecologist based in Glasgow and Edinburgh who are based at what has been described as Scotland's mesh centres of excellence. But these centres are often staffed by the very surgeons who implanted the mesh in the first place and who may be subject to litigation by the same patient, therefore they won't operate. For those who are accepted for remedial surgery, they want and expect full mesh removal. And many have been told that is what they would get but the reality is, despite Scottish Government press release that came out today, the reality is that full mesh removal is not available in Scotland. Instead, the mesh that is accessible to the surgeon when they operate is removed and the rest, rest is left inside uh, their body. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I repeat, removal is not available for full mesh removal in Scotland. And like, unlike the rest, of the UK surgeons in Scotland favoured the type of mesh implant which has caused the most crippling of injuries because of where it was placed and the fact that it's so much bigger. In the uh, US, uh, Dr. Dionysius Veronicus has developed new techniques and special, special medical instruments that allow him to carry out successful full mesh removal. His pioneer methods developed over a decade, mean that the entire mesh implant is removed carefully and in one piece. He then photographs the mesh, he measures it to ensure that it corresponds with what was put in on the records, what's on, on the medical records, and ensures that these correspond. Therefore, he can confirm by photograph that the entire piece has been removed. Previously, the Scottish NHS was sending patients to see Dr. El Neil at University College London. Uh, Dr. El Neil carries out full mesh removal, but her list is closed and she has a huge backlog. But now, right now, we have a small window of opportunity to act. An opportunity that if we don't take it, it will be lost. And that is to take up the very genuine offer from Dr. Veronicus to come to Scotland, to work up to six days a week, to carry out full mesh removal procedures, but critically also to train Scottish surgeons in his techniques. This is a serious and a genuine offer that I urge the Cabinet Secretary to take. In correspondence with me, the Cabinet Secretary has rightly said Dr Veronicus must be, and I quote, of appropriate professional standing and recognised by the General Medical Council. None of us in this room, I'm sure, would disagree with that sentiment. But this can be done. Dr. Veronicus is a leading international expert in his field. Uh, many surgeons want to learn from him, including Christopher Harden, the chairman of the British Association of Urogynecologists, one of the UK's top specialists. Uh, Dr. Veronicus has specialised 
in obstetrics and gynaecology since 20, uh, 2000, and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery since 2013. He was awarded this Distinguished Surgeon Award from the US Society of Gynaecological Surgeons in 2018, and he has a hugely impressive CV. He could quickly be registered as what the GMC call a visit, visiting eminent specialist. And that would mean he could complete the GMC registration process. So registration is not a barrier to him coming here. What we would then need is for the NHS to cover his costs and provide an operating theatre for him to work in. Now, it's my opinion that this could be financed using some of the additional 27 million that the Cabinet Secretary recently allocated to waiting times reduction. Because after all, mesh survivors have been waiting years, not weeks, years for such treatment. Cabinet Secretary, these are exceptional circumstances and they require an exceptional response. And if you're wondering what such an action would deliver, then please look no further than the gallery of this parliament. Because here today is Dr. Mary McLaughlin, a law lecturer from Ireland. Mary has flown over today because she wanted to be here to prove the impact of full mesh removal carried out by Dr. Veronicus. On January the 14th, she paid £15,000 from her own savings to go to the US for surgery. She had all of the 20 centimetres of mesh that were implanted removed from her body. Within a few days, she had much more mobility. Within a few weeks, she was walking again. And today, she is so free of pain and suffering that she travelled to Edinburgh as living proof of what this procedure can mean. And compare that to her previous condition. Unable to carry on with her job, virtually bedridden, and in so much chronic pain, she couldn't even sit with her family to enjoy Christmas dinner. Just two months after her surgery with doc Dr. Veronicus, she's well enough to travel here to be with us today. Compare that to Lorna Farrell, who's in the gallery, or Claire Daisley from Greenock, and many others who've ended up in even more pain and in wheelchairs following so-called full mesh removal in Scotland. They still have mesh inside them, despite being told that they would have full mesh removal. And there are others who have been told that the mesh uh, implant they were given cannot be fully removed here. Well, the reality is that Dr. Veronicus can do it, and he's offering to come to Scotland to train our surgeons to do it. Now, the decision to do this or not lies with the Cabinet Secretary and no one else. I don't beg government ministers ever, but I implore you today, Cabinet Secretary, I implore you, please do the right thing and give these injured women the best treatment that is available. These women have lost so much. They've lost so much. They should not, as some are, have to travel to the US and elsewhere, eh, begging, borrowing, stealing, using their life savings or whatever to try and buy treatment. The Cabinet Secretary has the chance to act, has the opportunity to change lives. Cabinet Secretary, you've got the chance to do the right thing. The alternative is these women left living a life of pain, a life of misery, careers and relationships lost, and with a lifetime of medical costs, which I believe if we take that collectively, will far outstrip the costs that would ever be, uh, uh, have to be made to bring this surgeon to Scotland. These women were implanted in Scotland. The recommendation for this procedure was given in Scotland. All they ask for, all they ask for, is the realistic opportunity to have this dreadful material removed from them in Scotland. Thank you very much. Uh, and can I say gently to members of the public in the gallery, I do understand why you're applauding, but it is not permitted in the Parliament. Uh, I have to say I have many members wishing to speak, so from now on, 
I would ask to be restricted to four minutes to allow uh, us to get through everybody and to allow the Cabinet Secretary time to respond. I call Alec Neill to be followed by Miles Briggs, please. Thank you very much indeed, the Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate Neil Finlay in obtaining this Member's Bill on this very vital and serious issue. Can I just start by saying I think everybody in this chamber is absolutely united in the need to make sure that the National Health Service in Scotland does the right thing by these women whose lives have been so badly affected as a result of botched procedures in relation to mesh implants or botched devices, or in some cases, both. Uh, it's estimated there are about 1,000 women currently who are in a very bad place as a result of these mesh implants. And the, many of these women, most of these women, think that they, probably rightly, that the only way to deal with the problem is to remove the mesh. And I think a lot of clinicians agree with that. I know that I have a constituent who has suffered from this for the last 10 years and has been told that she cannot have the mesh removed because they cannot be sure how, how and how and where the mesh is embedded into her system internally. So this is a very serious issue indeed. And the key point is that for women, for many women, removal of the mesh is the last chance saloon to try to recover at least some of their health. So the issue is how best can we address that? Now, there are some women who have been and had mesh removed partially or even entirely within Scotland. But it appears that the new technology and the new techniques pioneered by Dr. Veronic Veronicus in St. Louis in the United States is a, on a level of its own uh, where the performance appears to be very consistent of a high quality and extremely effective. Clearly, we need to be sure that that all can happen for our people here in Scotland. He uses, as I understand it, microsurgery. And one of the important points is that he can use a particular type of ultrasound, translabial ultrasound, and that can locate the mesh before surgery. And in the absence of this scan, mesh removal surgery is essentially happening blindly and only partially. And there are other major benefits to this technique and this technology as well. Uh, and the, one of the important points is the operation can be, can, can be conducted through the groin uh, in addition to the vagina, which allows for better access in many cases to full mesh removal uh, in uh, one operation. And my worry is that we will have so many women so desperate if we don't do something here in Scotland, we will end up with them having to spend their life savings, get into debt, to go to America to get this procedure done. So I think every avenue should be explored with our health boards, with our consultants, with the National Health Service to make sure that we can get access to this service in Scotland through Dr. Veronica's. And the important point, presiding officer, uh, whether he comes and does procedures or not, the really important point is that he comes to train people in Scotland in this new technology and using these new techniques. Because that means after he goes home, we have the capacity to continue to provide full mesh removal through this technique for women in Scotland where it is appropriate and where they require it. So I do believe we need to look at how we can do this, achieve this, because we owe it to these women uh, to try to improve their lives. And in many of these cases, that can only happen with full mesh removal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Neil. I call Miles Briggs, we're followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Mr. Briggs, Deputy please. Presiding Officer. Can I thank my Lothian colleague, uh, Neil Finlay, for bringing forward this debate this evening and once again commend Mr. Finlay, Jackson Carlow, and as we've heard, Alec Neil, for their campaigning and ongoing work to deliver justice for MESH survivors. I'd also like to welcome to the public gallery many, many of the women and their families affected by the MESH scandal. 
As the co-chair of the Parliament's cross-party group on chronic pain, I've met with many women affected who have attended our meetings and shared their personal stories, and we should rightly pay tribute to each and every one of them. This debate is therefore a welcome opportunity to look at how the Scottish Government and our NHS should be working to meet the needs of MESH survivors and for those seeking full surgical removal, how this is being achieved in Scotland today and in the future. In preparing and researching for this de evening's debate, I must admit that more and more questions seem to be ri arising when looking at the detail of what's being proposed in Scotland, the availability of operations to achieve full MESH removal today. Now we know that in relation to TDT um, o mesh implants, this was historically used, used twice as much in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. The issues around its removal are well known and documented and present a number of issues. Therefore, in responding to the debate this evening, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to confirm a number of key points? How many mesh removal operations have actually been undertaken in NHS Scotland to date? Have these operations been partial removal or full removal? How many of our health boards, as Neil Finlay has mentioned, are putting aside funds for this surgery? And in addition, how many surgeons in Scotland today can actually undertake a full mesh removal? Deputy Presiding Officer, we need to make sure that our Scottish NHS can build the capacity now and in the future to deliver the surgery which will be needed to achieve full surgical mesh removal. I therefore fully understand and appreciate the disappointment and anger amongst MESH victims over the Scottish Government's de decision to date to decline the offer made by Dr Veronicus to travel to Scotland to work with NHS Scotland. As Neil Finlay has already outlined, Dr Veronicus has developed techniques to carry out full MESH removal and the opportunity for NHS Scotland to learn from this and the development of new procedures around the complex removal of MESH is rapidly developing and in such a vitally important area which, as Neil's outlined, we cannot allow to fall behind and we cannot and must not let Scottish patients to be at the back of the queue for MESH removal. Now, very briefly, yes. Joanne Lamont. Very briefly, and thank you very much for uh, allowing me to intervene, we do agree that part of the issue is about rebuilding trust and confidence in the health service. A lot of women feel very, very let down, and in taking this procedure forward, the confidence in knowing that someone else who's an expert to come and support the system is very, very important. Miles Briggs. I absolutely do, and I think the fact we're having this debate shows that we need to do more, um, because we've had these debates around the whole scandal, what we need to be doing is making sure we right these wrongs. Um, Mr Finlay's motion specifically calls on the Scottish Government to reconsider the invitation and, and work to help facilitate a genuine and positive offer which has been made. And I hope in closing the Cabinet Secretary will be able to respond to that positive offer. One very important issue which has been raised with me and has already been mentioned is the need for more uh, translabial uh, ultrasound scans. And that's also an area I think we need to see progress as well. Deputy, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's clear from ongoing issues and this debate, how the Scottish gov Government need to develop a sustainable plan for surgical removal of mesh implants. We need to see significant improvements um, in how we provide that help to mesh victims and their families. I therefore hope that the Cabinet Secretary will, will rethink genuinely the offer which has been made to NHS Scotland. We must never lose sight of the fact that it is the Scottish mesh survivors who are seeking solutions to address the life-changing injury and chronic pain which they um, have caused that which the mesh implants have caused to them. I therefore believe that every offer of support and the extension of the hand of friendship which we've seen should be pursued in, and considered by SNP ministers to try to start the process now to right the wrongs of the mesh implant scandal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Neil Findlay for securing this important debate and for his tenacious campaigning alongside these courageous women. I'd like to pay tribute to all of the women who have campaigned about MESH, many of whom are in the gallery today, and also thank colleagues Alec Neal and Jackson Carlaw for their cross-party commitment to this. I was at the press conference earlier today, and I'm not embarrassed to say that I was um, moved to, to tears by these painful and harrowing stories. And I would join others in, in pleading with the Cabinet Secretary to accept the help from the surgeon who is offering to treat these women. Because Scotland's mesh survivors are locked in a living nightmare. 
Despite their own pain and loss, these women have been campaigning for years so that other women don't suffer the same fate as a result of these barbaric mesh implants. Many have debilitating symptoms, including chronic pain and loss of mobility. But today, as Neil Findlay has said, after years of selflessly campaigning for other women, they are asking for something for themselves. There is a glimmer of hope. But it is galling that these women are even being put in a position where they have to ask for help, to beg for help. As one of the women in committee room three said today, they got these implants in Scotland, the damage was done in Scotland, so the damage should be repaired here in Scotland. These women have been let down time and time again. They have had to become experts in their own condition where medical advice has failed and where government interventions have been lacking. One campaigner today described her feelings of frustration, but even more upsetting that of having no self-worth because when her mesh symptoms um, were explained to a doctor, it was simply dismissed. She was told she had mental health problems. Mental ill health can understandably occur as a result of chronic pain, but when it is blamed as the root cause of the pain, that is simply cruel. I am the convener of the cross-party group on women's health, so I've heard many women, including endometriosis and lipedema campaigners, say that they too have had their symptoms disregarded. So if the mesh survivors have taught us anything, is that as a society, we must start valuing women, believing women and listening to women. With Dr Veronica is offering to come to Scotland to treat women with complete removal of mesh. There is now a real chance to see their conditions improved and hope for the future. And Alec Neal is absolutely right. It's not about simply coming to perform the operations. We have to take the learning from that and train our own staff um, because it's not just an issue for Scotland. It's, an, it's a global scandal, as we all know. The mesh women... Um, not just the ones that are here tonight, but hundreds of women across Scotland have been holding each other up. We've heard firsthand from Dr Mary McLaughlin, who's come over from Northern Ireland, the transformative difference this treatment can make. Her story is one of hope to Scotland's mesh survivors. And like Neil Findlay, I'm not too proud to stand here and beg the Cabinet Secretary to use her power to make this hope a reality for these women. In conclusion, presiding officer, I pay tribute to these women, these campaigners and their families. I add my voice to Neil Findlay's and to other colleagues across the chamber that these women deserve this treatment. And I hope in her remarks, the cabinet secretary is going to make that, that commitment tonight. Thank you very much. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Tavish Scott. Ms Johnson, please. Uh, thank you. Presiding Officer, and I too would like to thank Neil Finlay for giving us the opportunity to debate this issue this evening. And I'd also like to thank Alex Neil and Jackson Carlo for their long-standing commitment to this issue. I'll never forget meeting the MESH survivors when they came to Parliament in 2017. A group of women who'd undergone surgery to help address incontinence, who then found themselves requiring crutches and wheelchairs, no longer able to lift their beloved grandchildren, I met a woman and her husband who spoke openly of dealing with 24 hour a day incontinence. I spoke to women who'd had to resign from important work, important jobs. And I spoke to women who could no longer care for those they loved caring for. These very personal impacts and ex experiences shared openly with politicians and others, they can't fall upon deaf ears. Today, Irish Mesh campaigner, Dr Mary McLaughlin has come to the Scottish Parliament to share her story. And as we've heard, Dr McLaughlin was operated on by Dr Veronicus and the outcome has been transformative. As party spokespeople, as parliamentarians, as empathetic human beings, we need to act. When there's increased knowledge, experience and developments in techniques and instrumentation to remove these implants, we must use it. And we can't rely on individuals finding the money, a prohibitive sum for far too many individuals, but the Scottish Government must step in and help because we can all appreciate how infuriating, how frustrating it must be to know that there's now a potential solution, that the excruciating pain 
that these women are living with might end, but I have to watch and wait and hope that somehow they too might be helped. Now, it's clear that there is consensus across the chamber that we can, that we must do all that we can to help women whose lives have been destroyed by these implants. There seems to be some debate too around how comprehensive mesh removal is here in Scotland. Um, in, in opening, um, Neil Finlay spoke about the fact that women who Dr Veronica treats are given evidence of the full mesh removal, that it's measured, that they see photos. And given how psychologically damaging it must feel to have you know, something inside that you just want removed, I can see why this is really important evidence. Um, and I would be grateful um, when the Cabinet Secretary speaks in closing if she could confirm whether or not full mesh removal is available in Scotland and how much evidence those having the procedure receive. I'd be grateful too if she could confirm that any barriers there might be to learning from Dr Veronicus can and will be removed. I mean, surely in this age of global knowledge exchange, we must strive to learn from experts in all fields. Presiding officer, mesh survivors have had to campaign too long and too hard to have mesh banned. And I've absolutely no doubt that these inspirational and brave women and their families will campaign for access to full removal. But have we not already asked far too much of them? Thank you. Thank you. I call Tavish Scott, we followed by Rona Mackay. Mr Scott, please. Can I thank uh, Neil Finlay for giving me the chance to raise Bobby Daly's case. Bobby is a very brave woman who lives in the north of Shetland. She has lived for 20 years with mesh inside her body. She has a son who is 32 years old with Down syndrome. She cares for him and she puts up with, as Alison Johnson rightly has just said, excruciating pain in every day of her life. Uh, I'm, I, won't, I can't be the only constituency member uh, who, when someone like Bobby comes to see you, puts everything else into perspective. All the stuff we deal with as politicians is but nothing compared to someone who goes through the hell of having this inside them and have, ha having had that go on for 20 years uh, of their life. Now, Bobby is in Aberdeen this week for an MRI scan and she has an appointment at the Greater Glasgow Hospital later, uh, later this month. She wants all that stuff out of her body, all of it out of her body. Uh, as she said uh, the last time she came to see me, uh, she, like uh, thousands of other uh, women, never gave consent, never gave co consent for medical procedures involving mesh. Uh, she was never informed of the possible uh, and actual consequences of mesh. She never gave consent to be in constant pain all her life and for her life to be made a misery. She never gave consent for lacerations of vessels, of nerves, of organs, including the bladder, the bowel, uh, transitory local irritation of the uh, wound, mesh extrusion, and so it goes on, and so it goes on. And she could give me a list, a really tough list uh, that one could read uh, through that. Sorry, Mr Finlay. I wonder if um, uh, your constituent has um, even guesstimated how much all of her treatment has cost the NHS to date? Before, before you respond, uh, Mr Scott, I'm just uh, mindful, and I'm not sure whether your constituent is one, but to ask members not to get into cases which may be subject to civil actions at the moment. I'm not aware whether that is in that case, but just to say to members, to caution them as it might be some judicy. You don't need to caution me on legal action on this one, um, sorry, officer. That's fine, thank um, you. Uh, I, I take uh, Neil Finlay's point. The answer is no. I, I think Bobby's got better things to do than worry about how much uh, it's all cost because of the uh, because uh, and just and worry about how she cares for her son. Uh, never mind dealing with the uh, with with all of that. Uh, uh, go on then. No. Neil Finlay. The point I was making is that the amount that this costs for the NHS could easily easily deal with the cost of bringing this doctor to Scotland to carry out procedures. I, I, Tavis I, Scott. Entirely take that point. Entirely uh, take that point. So I only want to make two other uh, points. The first is the one that Neil Finley also reflected in his remarks, and that is about um, both the physical uh, pain and the physical pressure on an individual, but also the psychological pressure. And that's why uh, I am really concerned uh, in a set, a set of circumstances where the NHS tries to force women to go to see the same clinician in the same hospital where they had the, where they had the treatment that caused all this difficulty uh, 
uh, first time uh, round. Where someone going through this kind of pain in these circumstances asks for a different clinician and a different hospital, that is just what should happen. And if the Cabinet Secretary can help people with that, that would be uh, very important indeed. Uh, the final point I want to make is the government's statement today that, again, Neil Finlay mentioned. I was pretty concerned, uh, and I quote, when I read, uh, we would be happy to discuss with both boards, health boards and professionals, funding of additional education and training where a specific need is identified. Now, um, I'm a great admirer of Jean Freeman. I think she's a very able uh, politician and a great operator, which is badly needed in politics uh, at the moment. I hope she might want to reflect on where um, uh, her spokesman put out a statement saying where a specific need is, is uh, identified. I think that's what this place has done. It's done it through the campaigning of Jason Carlow, uh, Alec Neil, and, and Neil Finlay. It's done it through colleagues uh, from across the political uh, benches. We need some leadership from the government here. Bobby Daly deserves all that mesh out of her body. Can the government please make sure that now happens. Thank you very much. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Annie Wells. Ms Mackay, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Neil Findlay for bringing this member's debate to the Chamber today and to pay tribute to his passionate support of MESH victims, not just in Scotland, but throughout the world. Presiding Officer, tonight we're debating an issue that will go down in history as one of the greatest medical injustices ever suffered by women. I think that is beyond dispute. There's cross-party consensus that has existed since the horrendous problems with mesh implants came to light, which resulted in the ill-fated moratorium on implants in 2014, instigated by the then Health Secretary, Alec Neil, who also continues to fight long and hard for justice for mesh victims. We now have a ban on implants brought in by current Health Secretary, Jean Freeman, which was warmly welcomed by campaigners. But, presiding officer, now is not the time to dwell on the history of this scandalous issue. Neil Findlay's motion says the Scottish Government are refusing to bring renowned mesh specialist uh, Dr Veronicus to Scotland to train surgeons and perform mesh removal operations in Scotland and I look forward to hearing the Cab Cabinet Secretary's response to that. Presiding Officer, nothing should be off the table. Um, it should not be a political issue and I'm glad we've always had consensus across the Chamber because the many women in the Chamber today couldn't care less about politics. They just want respite from the daily struggle they've endured since this operation was performed. Campaigning journalist Marion Scott didn't get involved with this campaign because it was a good story. She got involved to get answers as to why a procedure that women were told would help them has ruined their lives. The women have been badly let down by health boards, the medical establishment and a disgraceful flawed review. In the past I've called them brave and courageous for taking on this fight, which they are, but I don't think that's any comfort because I'm sure most days they don't feel brave or courageous. Presiding officer, last Friday I had a meeting with directors at Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board regarding a constituency matter and I took the opportunity to raise with them the issue of Dr Veronica's coming to Scotland. They told me that exchange training vis visits between surgeons happened regularly and were reciprocal with our top specialists going abroad to train surgeons in another country and many coming here to do the same. They also told me that visits take place under direction from the chief medical officer and that there is a budget to do so. So I found that very encouraging. Um, uh, however, as Neil Findlay said, anyone providing assistance to health boards must have appropriate clearance from the GMC. Dr Veronica is not registered with the GMC, but I really hope that a solution can be found to resolve this, and I was encouraged by what uh, Neil Findlay said. And so I urge health boards to consent to finding a way to bring Dr Veronica here for the sake of the sufferers and for the benefit of our surgeons who wish to expand their knowledge and skills because the bottom line is we should be performing these operations in Scotland. Yes. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I think what the member says is extremely interesting, but I wonder if she would agree with me that the Chief Medical Officer should take an interest, particularly since she has set out her feelings on women's health inequality in Scotland just recently. Rona Mackay. I, I definitely do agree with that, and I think this is, a, this is a, an ideal opportunity to to demonstrate that, you know, what, what she, she meant when she said that, uh, that there couldn't be a greater cause than this. Um, so finally, presiding officer, I would like to echo my colleague Alec Neill's earlier call for a global conference to be held here in Scotland, because I think we can lead the way in this fight for justice. We have the best campaigners in the world in the MESH survivors group. Our country has a reputation for fairness, and we must always stand united with MESH sufferers here and throughout the world. Thank you very much.
And before, uh, before I call the next member to speak, can I say due to the number of members who still wish to speak in the debate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. And I invite Neil Finlay to move a motion without notice. Okay, moved. Thank you. The question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is agreed. So I now call Annie Wells to be followed by Elaine Smith. Ms Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And first of all, I would like to also put my thanks um, on record to Neil Finlay, Jackson Carlow and Alex Neil for their commitment in campaigning for justice for these women. And of course, it goes without saying uh, that, that all the tireless and passionate work of the campaigners who have fought passionately to get vi MESH victims the justice they deserve. And I also want to welcome them to the Chamber this evening. As shown by the strength of feeling in the Chamber, there is a great deal of disappointment amongst MESH victims over the Scottish Government's decision to decline the offer made by Dr Veronicus. One can only imagine the pain victims face on a daily basis and the, and the worry of those yet to learn if the MESH will have the same life-altering impact on them as the women they have met and read about. I hope today we can have a frank and honest discussion about the best way forward for MESH victims. And if it is feasible for Dr Veronicus to make the journey to Scotland, then this option should be, of course, be fully explored. No one wishes to see MESH victims suffering needlessly, and I have no doubt today that we're all in agreement on that. The journey getting to this stage, when we're beginning to look at solutions, has been a long and difficult one. The mesh which can be used in pelvic organ prolapses and incontinence women has been used in more than 20,000 women in Scotland over the past 20 years. Though there have been a number of high profile cases in the media, the number of women affected is unfortunately still unknown. And the potential side effects of mesh are truly awful. They can range from chronic pain and loss of sexual function to major complications like the implant intruding through the bladder or bowels even necessitating the removal of organs. It can shrink or move inside the body, slicing through nerve endings, tissue and org organ organs, and is very difficult to sometimes or impossible to, to remove. The offer made by Dr Veronicus is therefore an appealing one, and I can completely understand why this would have no doubt given hope to those affected and those worried about the future. The Scottish Conservatives, led by Jackson Carlow, have been on the side of the victims from the start. And in 2017, 97 MSPs signed a pledge opposing any whitewashing of the MESH report. And the Scottish Conservative MSPs have been calling for an end to the dam damaging MESH procedures in Scotland. <clears throat> and we welcomed the halt to MESH procedures announced by the Cabinet Secretary last September. This support will continue, which is why we're calling on the Scottish Government to give full consideration of this offer and, if feasible, given the necessary checks, to proceed. I, too, attended Neil Finlay's press conference this afternoon and it was truly heartbreaking to hear the stories of how MESH has completely ruined these women's lives. One lady told us that she was on the list to have both her bowel and bladder removed. Another informed us that, having been told She'd go back to work in university six weeks after the initial operation. Ten years later, she has never returned. And hearing the story of Dr Mary McLaughlin, a MESH victim from Belfast, who paid for an operation by Dr Veronicus herself, was eye-opening, and I can completely understand the frustration of the women who want the same. It's only right that we explore this option in full and listen properly to concerns of the women affected so that they don't feel that they're fighting a constant uphill battle in being heard. Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to finish again by thanking the campaigners who have fought hard on this issue. This is a really difficult situation, and whilst we are entering uncharted territory, it is so important that decisions are made with caution and care. We all in this chamber want the best possible course of action to be taken, which is why the Scottish Conservatives are calling for this offer to be fully explored. We owe this to the MESH victims and hearing their stories again this afternoon reaffirmed that for me. Thank you very much.
I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Stuart McMillan. And Mr McMillan will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. And like others, can I commend Neil Finlay on securing this debate and also for his tireless work to uncover this women's health scandal and to get help and justice for the women victims. And of course, there are other MSPs, including Jackson Carlon, Alec Neil, and members of the Petitions Committee who've also worked for justice on behalf of MESH survivors and campaigners. And these are survivors who have been fighting for others and they now have hope for themselves. That's an important point I think we need to make this evening and it has already been made, but I will reiterate it. I want to also particularly commend Marion Scott, reported with the Sunday Post for her fearless determination to expose the issues and to support the brave women involved in the MESH campaign. We know that the MESH is supposed to be banned from use following the lengthy campaign, but we still hear stories that it is being used even without the knowledge and consent of patients in some cases, and that is worrying. We do, I think, also need to remind ourselves that the mesh we're discussing can carry with it serious complications, which include persistent chronic pain, sexual problems, mesh exposure through vaginal tissue, and injury to nearby organs such as bladder and bowel. As mentioned by Miles Briggs, a few months ago, Marion Scott and some of the mesh campaigners spoke at the CPG on chronic pain, of which I'm also a co-convener, to highlight the ongoing problems that women are suffering and to seek um, help and support, which for many women must now mean having the mesh properly and fully removed. The Scottish Government um, said today that full mesh removal has already been provided by specialist staff working here in Scotland, but we really need clarification of that because that is strongly disputed and it seems that the only option that's currently available in Scotland for many women sufferers is partial removal and that often makes the situation worse and it can cause autoimmune disorders and sadly we know how autoimmune disorders are treated um, with the thyroid scandal another women's health scandal to add to the list that my colleague Monica Lennon put on the record. Removal did not go well for Lorna Farrell whom we heard from at the press conference today and whose story was in last week's Sunday Post. Lorna is now a wheelchair user following supposed removal of the mesh by surgeons in Scotland. Lorna says that her specialist admitted that they can't fully remove the type of mesh implants that are most used in Scotland. And not only does Lorna now have increased pain, but she still has mesh left inside her. Claire Daly's story was also outlined in the Sunday Post. Claire is also in a wheelchair after removal surgery and is now waiting to have her bowel and bladder removed. And she is hoping that it might not be too late for her to, um, to have other options. Many women, of course, have been crippled with pain following the implants of the mesh. Um, and we understand that some of it wasn't even thoroughly tested before it was first used on women. And now they're being further damaged by botched efforts to remove it. I think that safe removal is the very least that our NHS should be providing. And it could be providing it because Dr. Veronicus, an eminent specialist in the US, as we've heard from Neil Finlay and others, could not only perform life-changing surgery, to reverse the damaging pre procedures performed in Scottish women, but importantly could train surgeons here to perform the procedure. There doesn't seem to be anything standing in the way of that, except it seems the Scottish Government's agreement to that. Mary McLaughlin, as we've heard from Northern Ireland, has had successful removal by Dr Veronicus. Um, she has her life back. And at today's uh, press conference, the MESH survivors said they want to be Mary but of course Mary had to pay herself and that's a divide between those with personal funds or who can actually get together the personal funds and those with none. Women who've lost their livelihoods dependent on benefits cannot pay to go to America for surgery and that surgery surely surely must come to them. Mesh survivors have campaigned for seven years to have mesh banned. They cannot be expected to campaign for another seven years for life-changing surgery to remove the botched mesh. Presiding officer Jane Freeman can stop this scandal. Um, she can give women their lives and their jobs back and she surely, surely must do so. It's not only right for the individual women, but it will be much more cost effective in the long run for the NHS and for society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presenting officer. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Neil Finlay for securing this uh, member's debate. Um, in my near uh, 12 years as an MSP, um, I've heard many uh, difficult and challenging issues uh, raised uh, with me by constituents. But I'll certainly never forget what, uh, what one constituent told me in 2017 about the pain that she lives with on a daily basis. 
the because of having a transvaginal mesh implant. The effect that it's had on my constituents' day-to-day -day ability to do simple tasks, most of us would actually take for granted. Um, and it just has become so, so problematic for her. Now, she would not wish this pain and suffering on anyone. Other women in Inverclyde have also contacted me about the issue and also informed me of uh, similar things that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I very much acknowledge and also appreciate the devastating impact mesh implants can have on a person's life. However, in, even in the most difficult of situations, politicians sometimes do need to take a wee step back to, act, to try and have a balanced view. But, and there's a spice briefing for today's debate. No, it's actually, it has been acknowledged that damage from transvaginal mesh isn't inevitable and that for some women the procedure has been successful and they continue to be pain free. But notwithstanding this, notwithstanding this, I very much highlight the suffering that I've mentioned before. One woman negatively uh, affected by mesh implants is one woman too many. Uh, but clearly, uh, the issue of mesh implants has affected far too many women in Scotland. And certainly something has got to be done to improve the situation. But Jean Freeman, the, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, uh, in September last year, took the bold decision to effectively ban the use of transvaginal mesh in NHS Scotland for pelvic organ uh, prolapse and stress urinary incontinence. And some may argue that the decision you know, should have been taken uh, earlier, uh, but I'm glad that the, the government did listen uh, to the recommendations made by the Petitions Committee, as has been referred to uh, already. Uh, and, and I do welcome the decision. I welcome the decision then, uh, but we now have this new challenge. And that's the, uh, the issue of this motion in front of us, uh, and the issue that, uh, that Neil Finlay has brought to us regarding Dr. Veronicus coming to Scotland to support patients with mesh implants that need to be removed. With approximately 1,000 women potentially needing their implant removed, it would appear that there is merit for Dr. Veronicus to, to certainly come to Scotland to help these women. Now, I'm not an expert in by any manner of means in this situation. Now, whether it's Dr. Veronicus coming here or for with the Scottish women going to America to get the assistance from Dr. Veronicus, now, uh, I, I, I'm not going to take that, uh, take that decision, but I generally think if Dr. Veronicus came here, the idea of actually treating women, but also uh, the educating our professionals so that the NHS in Scotland can actually deal with the situation going forward as compared to having to rely upon uh, bringing somebody in from America or elsewhere to, to deal with the situation going forward, I think is a very strong argument. The idea of teaching and educating uh, our professionals uh, was so, so important in, in my opinion. I would like to see measures implemented to help not just my own constituents, but all the women in Scotland who actually need the assistance. And uh, I think certainly the contributions from colleagues across the chamber today has been extremely powerful uh, in, with, in this particular regard. Presiding officer, if there is a reason for, Dr. for Dr. Veronica's not to come here to help my constituents and also help all the women in Scotland, I would like to be aware of what that uh, particular is. But also be keen for our NHS to actually obtain now, the assistance of this expert and to help deliver uh, the improved outcomes for many women in Scotland. In politics, we sometimes talk about inputs and outcomes. Inputs being the money, but and the outcomes being uh, how that money is actually spent. For me, it's a very simple uh, situation here. Uh, the input is about getting an expert to come over to help, but the outcome is for women to actually have a better life, uh, with a, a life free of pain. Now, I think that's an extremely strong message. Uh, and I certainly uh, encourage the, the Cabinet Secretary, whether it's her directly or getting the NHS boards to, to bring uh, Dr. Veronica over here, I think would be extremely useful for all of women in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now call Jean Freeman to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, can I say at the outset, I'm grateful for the opportunity to close um, this very important debate and I thank Mr Finlay for bringing it to the Chamber. I recognise very, very many women have suffered a significant amount and continue to suffer a significant amount of pain, uh, of distress, of immobility, of deterioration in the quality of their life as a result of mesh complications. And like others, I express my sympathy to them, but I know that that sympathy is of little use 
when your daily life is so marred by something that you thought would help you and actually has made your situation worse. I also want to recognise before I go any further the tireless work of the MESH survivors group and indeed colleagues across this chamber, many of whom have spoken tonight in making sure that these issues are front of mind. I remain convinced that the decision I took last year to halt the use of transvaginal mesh for pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence was and remains the right one. But I am also convinced that a great deal of the evidence and the impetus to make that decision comes indeed from those women themselves. Now it is absolutely right to turn to the question of their situation and the complications uh, that they face and the pain that they face. Let me repeat, full mesh removal is available in Scotland and photographic evidence is used in that procedure. But it is clear that there is a dispute around this. And so before I go any further, let me make this offer that I will uh, discuss with Mr. Finlay, with Mr. Carson, with Mr. Neil, the three prominent members in this chamber who have led the chamber's work in this, the evidence that I have to support that against the views of women I know expressed earlier today uh, and elsewhere, I know may well be expressed to me later when I meet some of them, that that is not the case. Um, yes, of course. Um, Neil Finlay. The analogy I used today at the event today was, um, if, if full mesh can be removed, I could come along just now with a piece of chewing gum and stick it in your hair. I could then come along with a pair of scissors and very quickly chop that out. Or I could come along with an instrument that one hair at a time would remove that piece of mesh. This is the difference that we're talking about. Because if you do the former, then you damage people's tissue, their nerves, and you leave them in chronic pain. If you take the approach that Dr. Veronicus does, you have microsurgery that removes it in a single piece with very little damage. So even if you provide us with the evidence, it's not comparing apples and apples. Cabinet Secretary. So Mr. Finlay, I've heard what you've said and I'd like you to wait till I've finished to hear everything that I'm going to say as well. But you and I point. take the point you make, although neither you nor I our clinicians. Never said I was. So Never let's said I was. let's let's proceed in as calm and reasonable a way as we possibly can. Our specialist centres offer a range of treatments, and importantly, those treatments are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Importance in that is the shared decision making and the informed consent. Indeed, we touched on some of that when I took the decision last year to end the use of mesh. Uh, in terms of those other uh, conditions that I mentioned. In response to Mr. Briggs' questions, I don't have all of the detail uh, that you asked, but so, and I will make sure that that is provided to you and indeed to other members. But the information that I have is that after mesh removal procedures, photographic evidence is taken. There remain approximately 120 referrals to the service per year and full groin dissections are performed at the rate currently of two per month. The other information you asked for, as I've said, I will make available to you. The clinicians involved in those two specialist centres are highly skilled and trained. And let me be clear too, because this point has, raised, has been raised, that GMC guidelines are clear that no treatment should be refused to a patient because that patient has either complained or is engaged in litigation with the clinician involved. And should that be the case, then I do want to know that because that is absolutely contrary to GMC guidelines. But these clinicians, like clinicians across our National Health Service, are engaged in continually developing their skills and practice. So there is, as Rona Mackay rightly said, a process by which this happens. It is commonplace across our health service to exchange uh, clinicians between one country and another, to learn new techniques, to study the research and the data that is gathered in order to improve skills and improve understanding. And there is a process that is gone through 
in order to ensure that happens. It need not be lengthy, it need not be complicated, but it is an important one nonetheless. It isn't my decision as a Cabinet Secretary to decide what clinical practice or clinical learning should take place. That is for the clinical community in conjunction with their health board, sometimes with the involvement of their Royal College. But my job, my job, I'm really clear what my job is, you give me a wee sec. My job is that where that is considered by those clinicians to be the right thing to do, my job is to help make that happen. And before I take your intervention, let me be absolutely clear for the record. I have not refused an invitation from Dr. Veronicus. What I have said, and Mr. Finlay rightly uh, made it clear in his opening, what I have said is there is a process to go through and if either the clinicians or the health board or a Royal College uh, believe that this would be useful to them, then my job is to help make that happen where I can. Ms. Smith. Elaine Smith. Well, I would rather move on slightly, presiding officer, but I would certainly hope that the Cabinet Secretary might wish to make it clear to the health boards that it's something that she wants pursued. What I did want to ask the Cabinet Secretary was that she did actually take a, a clinical decision because if she had not banned the use of this mesh, then clinicians in Scotland would still be using it. So the clinical decision would be still to use it if the Health Secretary had not taken a decision to have it banned. Cabinet Secretary. And I made that decision based on clinical advice and clinical evidence. My point that I am making is that none of us in this chamber are clinicians. And so therefore, I'm not, I'm not arguing that you did say it, Mr. Finlay. I'm simply trying to take us through what is the right thing for me to do as a cabinet secretary and where I need to get advice from in that regard. And so, yes, I'll take an intervention, of course. Neil Finlay. So when I uh, wrote to you initially about this, and have you initiated those discussions? What has been the outcome of those discussions? How much further have we moved this forward in the intervening time before um, we've come to today? Or is it today's parliamentary debate that will um, ensure that we begin those discussions? Cabinet Secretary. No, today's parliamentary debate does not ensure we begin those discussions. Indeed, on the 22nd of February, our accountable officers, members will remember uh, from uh, the last statement I made on MESH that I talked about accountable officers. They are, in effect, our medical directors in our uh, individual health boards uh, met. They considered some of the follow through from that uh, protocol, uh, exceptional uh, circumstance protocol from the halting of the use uh, of MESH in those procedures that I talked about, about the high vigilance scrutiny, about the registry. And they all, there was, has also been discussions between myself and the chief medical officer about whether or not there is uh, additional expertise and techniques that could be helpful to the specialist centres uh, involved in Scotland. And I will get to this point, but we will continue to see if that is possible for us to do. The other area, of course, that we have pursued, uh, as uh, I believe both Mr. Finlay uh, and others know, is with the MHRA, because uh, MESH itself uh, needs, to, needs to be proven to be safe. And we have pursued with the MHRA the evidence that they can offer us, that UK body, which is the body that approves the use of mesh and other such devices, what evidence they have of the procedures that they went through in order to be assured of the safety of that particular product. And we continue to pursue them on that. On this particular question, let me repeat, nobody needs to implore me Nobody needs to beg me. I completely understand that the women involved rightly want to have the best possible response to the situation that they find themselves in. And for many of them, that will require full mesh removal. What we need to do, what I need to do, is with the clinicians involved, look at whether there is additional training expertise, learning that can be provided by Dr. Veronicus or others, what we need to do to ensure that that happens. I've heard what has been said. I respect absolutely what colleagues say 
I remember being in the garden lobby myself the first time the women affected came to this parliament. So with the chief medical officer, I will look at what we can do with that clinical community to see what further learning and inquiry on techniques I'll come no, in a the minute, cabinet secretary on must techniques conclude. and treatment must can conclude. be taken. And uh, what we're, we can we're in, do... We're, excuse me a minute, Cabinet Secretary. If you... I mean, we're now at 11 minutes you've been, and um, I can give you a little longer, but I think that, that we will have to conclude shortly. OK, I, I appreciate that, Presiding Officer. I'm almost finished. What I am saying to this chamber is that my mind is not closed to this. It is not entirely my decision. It is work I need to do with the clinical community, with the Chief Medical Officer. We will undertake further discussions in that regard. I have not refused Dr. Veronica's offer. It is not for me to accept that offer. It is for me to discuss with the clinical community how their learning and techniques could, in their opinion, be improved and enhanced, and we will do that. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.